Hello, and welcome to this presentation, African Violet Plant Health and Diagnostics, the good, the bad, the ugly. It's my pleasure to present this three-part presentation. I'm an advocate for public outreach and education with hope the information presented will be found educational and useful as you too do what you love, gardening and growing and showing African violets in other guest areas. This three-part presentation series can be viewed separately at your own pace. Slides contain audio and video or audio, which is activated by clicking on the associated icon on each screen. Screen video, audio, or audio can be repeated at your convenience just in case you wish to hear it again. Use your up and down or left and right arrows to navigate through the slides. And thank you again for your interest and enjoy the presentations. This is part one of a three-part presentation titled African Violet Plant Health and Diagnostics, The Good, the Bad, the Ugly. Part one, Integrated Pest Management. Hello, this is Glenda Williams and welcome to my world of African violets. I'm a native Texan residing in McDade, Texas, a gardening enthusiast, and I've grown African violets and other gessnerians since the 1970s. I have a bachelor's degree in industrial technology from the University of Houston with 42 years in the information technology industry. After retirement in 2016, I am now living the life I truly love, gardening, growing, and showing African violets in other guest areas, as well as owning my own small nursery business. I am the owner of Glenda's House of Violets and an AVSA commercial vendor. I'm affiliated with the African Violet Society of America, the Lone Star African Violet Council, the First Austin African Violet Society, the Central Texas Judges Council, the Austin Area Garden Council, and I am a senior AVSA judge. I'd like to start with a small disclaimer that I am a grower and small nursery owner. The information available in these presentations was collected over my many years of growing and learning about plant biology. I have specialist certification through the Texas Master Gardener Program as a volunteer plant health and diagnostics educator. My certification training focused on enhancing my skills to provide public education and outreach on the topic of plant health and diagnostics. In essence, I teach people how to perform research to identify plant health problems. I am not a certified entomologist, plant biologist, or a certified diagnostician. I value and rely on industry experts and educational resources to provide valuable information needed and requested by the growing community in my capacity as a volunteer diagnostics educator resource for my county extension agent. Thank you. African Violet Plant Health and Diagnostics, the good, the bad, the ugly. So what's good? Growing African violets, of course. What's bad? All those bad actors just waiting to create havoc and chaos in your plant room. What's ugly? Watching what happens when you don't pay attention to what's going on. So, do you know what's going on in your plant room? Part 1, Integrated Pest Management, IPM. In this presentation, you'll be introduced to an overview and concepts of IPM, a holistic view of IPM, the ecosystem world of our plants, IPM definitions covered in this presentation, the disease triangle, the disease life cycle, an overview of pesticides, fungicides, and other chemical treatments, including special emphasis on safety and use, and the basic 101 process of diagnosing plant health problems. So what is integrated pest management or IPM? Once you have a diagnosis, you'll want to implement a plant health management strategy to help you manage or resolve the issue or issues you've been experiencing. Texas A&M AgriLife Extension developed and supports a sound, field-tested management strategy called IPM. IPM looks at the big picture. IPM is a science-based approach founded on the collective principles of entomology, soil science, plant physiology, plant pathology, applied ecology, and other related sciences. IPM was developed from the horticulture industry's best practices, which are based on cost-effective strategies to avoid, prevent, and manage pest damage with minimum harm to human health, environment, and non-target organisms. IPM emphasizes approaches that minimize harm commonly associated with pest management disease and control in your gardens, landscapes, and other growing areas. For more information about the Texas IPM program, please visit this website. Now let's take a look at a holistic view of IPM. 
IPM as a management strategy is a more clinical perspective. IPM from a holistic perspective steps back from the clinical perspective to look at the ecosystem model from a more holistic view as a collective of many organisms, groups, species, and factors. IPM practitioners acknowledge insects, mites, pathogens, or disease-causing organisms, and weeds exist in populations or groups of interacting individuals of the same species. IBM practitioners take advantage of a plant's natural tolerance to herbivores or plant eaters, plant pests, and the impact of natural mortality factors of pest populations. IPM practitioners acknowledge the importance of climatic factors in regulating pest and pathogen populations, and IPM practitioners take advantage of a pest's natural mortality factors, conserving natural enemies by minimizing the use of broad-spectrum pesticides, and find ways to enhance the activities of beneficial insects. In summary, the IPM practitioner understands the synergistic balance of the collective as a whole ecosystem and works to maintain a healthy balance. Let's start with the basic ecosystem world our African violets live in. An ecosystem is a complex symbiotic system comprised of many living and non-living things within an environment that all interact synergistically as a unit. In a perfect ecosystem world, our African violets live in balance, peace, and calm. All is well, and everyone is happy. Two ecosystem factors contribute to the balance of the ecosystem. Abiotic factors are physical conditions not derived from living organisms such as lighting, temperature, airflow, and humidity. Biotic factors are living components that affect another organism or shapes the ecosystem such as plants, animals, bacteria, fungi, viruses, and insects. In a not-so-perfect, out-of-balance ecosystem world, havoc and chaos can happen. The following definitions in this slide will be used in this presentation. Please take a moment to review before proceeding to the next slide. Definitions are biotic, abiotic, pathogen, inoculum, plant disease, and diagnosis. What is the disease triangle? Infectious disease development requires a host that's susceptible, a pathogen that can cause disease, and an environment favorable for pathogen development. This is known as the disease triangle. Diseases will not develop if any one of these three factors are missing. In the case of infectious plant diseases, any practice that favors plant growth and reduces either the amount of pathogen present or its development of activity will result in significantly less disease. What is the disease life cycle? Once the disease cycle begins, it enters into a circular pattern. Inoculum is dispensed or dispersed into the environment. Inoculum finds and attaches to the host where it begins colonization and the infection process begins. After a period of time, symptoms begin to show. Secondary inoculum may also be created, dispersed, and the host then becomes reinfected with the secondary inoculum. Once the pathogen is colonized and established, it then produces survival structures to allow it to reproduce, disperse, and reinfect again. This cycle will continue unless interrupted. What are disease management strategies? Now that you've been introduced to the IPM strategy model, Let's explore your information collected during the investigation of your plant problem and apply IPM strategies to formulate a plant health management strategy that applies to your situation. Start by looking at the disease cycle of the pathogen you identified and hopefully thoroughly documented. All pathogens go through a circular cycle with similar events. Knowing how particular pathogens go through their individual disease cycles is important to develop strategies to manage the diseases. Your management strategies should include all points in a disease cycle where interventions can be made to break the pathogen disease cycle. Different strategies would involve different interventions. For example, Sterilization of your garden tools would be an intervention where you could clean your tools and the pathogen is hopefully removed and or killed. As a result, the pathogen reproductive cycle is potentially interrupted and the pathogen can hopefully be removed from your environment. Prevention is always the best approach to manage diseases. 
Suggestions to prevent development of plant health problems include resistance or immunity by selection of varieties that are easy to grow and more resistant to disease. Avoidance, implementation of effective cultivation techniques such as repotting, leaching, fertilization, pest control applications, etc. to create more favorable environments for plants or isolate plants temporarily from your healthy plants to avoid introduction of or contamination by unwanted pathogens. Exclusion. Use only healthy plants and methods such as sanitization and disinfection of growing areas and equipment to protect plants from pathogen invasions. And protection. Use physical, chemical, or biological barriers to protect plants from pathogen invasions. Examples would include effective management of temperature, humidity, airflow, isolation, separation, application of pest control, or use of beneficial insects. If the pathogen disease cycle has advanced to the point where prevention is no longer a viable strategy, you should then consider alternative treatment strategies. Therapy includes helping plants recover by pruning, clipping, removing dead plant materials, and cautious use of chemical products. Eradication involves killing or removing the pathogen and or diseased plant materials, as well as use of disinfection such as bleach or hydrogen peroxide to sanitize your growing environment. In the event the pathogen persists, you might then proceed with using chemical pesticides or fungicides. Due to their toxicity levels, using chemicals should only be considered when all other environmentally friendly options do not work. When other IPM techniques do not work, pesticides or herbicides may be your next viable option. Safety should always be considered when using pesticides or herbicides. As you can see, the chemical industry has thousands of products on store shelves. So how do you choose the right product? Be very careful. Both chemical and organic pesticides, if used improperly, can be ineffective, even dangerous. Side means kill. Pesticides are designed to kill pests and can even kill humans. Overexposure to pesticides can easily poison you, so be careful. Formulations describe the physical state, for example, aerosol dust solutions, so you want to be sure to choose a formulation that will most effectively work in your environment. The active ingredient is what kills pests. It's usually the first ingredient on the label and is marked active ingredient. Read the label thoroughly to learn about the active ingredient. Labels tell how to use the product correctly and include safety measures. Labels are in many cases written in scientific gibberish and are hard to understand. If you have questions, do your research to fully understand how the pesticide or herbicide works before opening the bottle. Some pesticides or herbicides are classified as restricted use, state limited use, or regulated and can only be purchased if you have a special applicator license. There are extensive laws governing the registration and use of pesticides or herbicides. These laws are under the governance of the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, and state agricultural agencies such as the Texas Department of Agriculture, or TDA. As an example, TDA licenses pesticide applicators who use or apply restricted use, state limited use, and regulated pesticides or herbicides. Printed information about a pesticide or herbicide product is called labeling, and the label is attached to the product container. The label provides detailed instructions on how to use the product correctly, the correct dosage, what special safety measures should be taken, and what plants or insects it can be used on. It is against the law to use a pesticide or herbicide in any manner not included in the labeling. It is also against the law to repackage or relabel for resale any restricted use, state limited use, regulated pesticides or herbicides. For example, eBay sellers who sell smaller quantities with a pipette are repackaging and relabeling products for resale. They attempt to skirt the intent of the law by selling the pipette while including the actual product as a sample. This is troubling to see, so please use your best judgment when considering a purchase like this. Improper labeling by a seller in this case could potentially result in a negative, unexpected outcome for the purchaser. The bottom line to remember is the individual who makes the final product purchase always assumes full responsibility for any outcomes, good or bad, from any direct contact with the product. So let's now hear some wise words from Paracelsus, the father of toxicology. The dose makes the poison. All things are poison and nothing is without poison. Only the dose makes that a thing is no poison.
The bottom line is all pesticides and herbicides, whether toxic or chemical, should always be considered toxic to humans unless otherwise noted on the label. Read and follow the label. It is the law. Doing otherwise increases the risk of making yourself or others around you very sick. Now that we've explored the basic foundations of plant health, it's time to look at how to diagnose a problem you might be experiencing in this next section, Diagnosing Plant Health Problems 101. Diagnosis is both science and art. Being able to successfully diagnose a plant health issue is necessary to keeping your plants healthy. As a gardener, you can conduct a basic plant diagnosis using your current experience, your keen observation skills, and specific knowledge of your plants and their common problems. There may be a more difficult situation where you just don't know what's going on and you're unable to come up with a reasonable diagnosis. In such a case, you may require more specialized training and knowledge, access to industry expertise, or even specialized laboratory protocols and equipment. Follow an organized and logical approach. Put on your detective hat and use those detective skills to ask and answer the right questions. Leave no stone unturned and document everything for future use. Do extensive research using reliable resources or reference materials. Anecdotal information may be somewhat useful, but it will not give you the complete and thorough answers you seek. Universities and government agencies will be your most reliable and accurate resources for research materials. Information from other sources can be considered, but should be verified and vetted before assuming it is factual. Use your common sense during the analysis process. Stick to factual data. Once you have your inf information collected, carefully analyze the data to come to your conclusion and diagnosis. Use proven established IPM strategies to approach your problem. In summary, the quality of your treatment decisions will depend on the quality of information collected to help you arrive at your final diagnosis. Know your plant. Does it have a name? How old is the plant? How long have you had it? Where is it growing? What is the normal healthy appearance of the plant when grown normally? Regularly check the health status of your plants. What are all the signs or symptoms observed? Have the symptoms progressed or is it a recurrence of symptoms? What are the current growth patterns of the plant? What cultural practices have you been using? What kind of soil is it growing in? What kind of soil, fertilizer, lighting, temperatures, or humidity does this plant prefer? What were the environmental conditions prior to or at the time the symptoms or signs were observed? Are there any other cultural or environmental factors at play? You can also reach out to other growing community peers, local nursery or garden centers, or even your local master gardener group. Monitor regularly to keep watch for pests and diseases. This usually requires extra time and effort on your part. Monitoring would include scouting, which is the regular systematic inspection of plants in your growing areas for pests and diseases, or detection. Identify when and where pests are active or plant symptoms begin. For example, yellow sticky cards or insect traps. Take the extra time and effort to monitor. It will pay off in the long haul. Losing your plant collections to unwanted pathogens is a very unpleasant, discouraging, and expensive experience. You can also contact your county extension agent for assistance with a professional diagnosis. Seek out a second opinion from a plant diagnostic laboratory if the answer is still elusive. The following sample instructions are the usual process you would follow to seek assistance from a plant diagnostic laboratory. It's very important to make the most effective use of integrated pest management or IPM tools and strategies. Given some of the incredibly silly and irresponsible things we did in our younger, less informed years, we should be surprised we've lived this long, right? On a more serious note, you should always carefully consider use and impact of preventative, cultural, biological, mechanical, and chemical control techniques before any implementations. Whenever possible, always use the most environmentally friendly, effective, and economical method available. Wouldn't it be wiser to use a hammer instead of a sledgehammer on the nail? 
let's try to live to a ripe old age without killing ourselves, okay? To summarize part one, Integrated Pest Management or IPM, we covered the topics in this outline, which hopefully provided you with an overall picture of Integrated Pest Management, IPM, and its associated strategies for management of any havoc or chaos you may be experiencing in your plant room. This is the conclusion of part one of a three-part presentation titled African Violet Plant Health and Diagnostics, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, Part One, Integrated Pest Management, IPM. Thanks for viewing this presentation. I hope you found it educational, interesting, and learned some basic strategies for management of your growing environment. Parts two and three are available as separate presentations for your viewing pleasure. Part two, Plant Health Problems, continues this presentation with more detail about plant problems experienced by African violet and other Gessnerid growers. In part three, a journey into the microcosmic world of AVs, please join me on a mystical journey that takes us into the microcosmos of the secret life of African violets. Thanks again for your time and your interest in this presentation.